Good evening, friends. We're here to remember and celebrate the life of a beautiful lady, the life of Alberta Jean Densford. And we want to honor the Lord who has blessed us by sharing her life with us. And we want to worship him for the salvation he offers us to all. And in times like these, when death interrupts our rapid pace, we have a rare opportunity in this day and age to kind of be still and reckon with the great realities of eternity that lie before us. We can get on the rat race so fast and so hard that we don't even stop to think about it. And God affords us that opportunity in times like these. Some of these occasions are dominated by grief and hopelessness and tragedy. Others by celebration. At this moment, which one do you think Gene would choose for us? Celebrate. <laughs> I heard that. <laughs> celebrate, celebrate. <laughs> Though some may think celebration amidst the sorrow of separation, the separation of death is contradictory to those of the Christian faith. It makes a whole lot of sense. We are not denying the sadness. We're not denying the emptiness. But by faith, we are seeing the greater and eternal nature of what Jesus has provided for his children. Let us seek comfort in God's living word. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, we read, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, and it doesn't end there. There's more. So that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. And in Hebrews chapter 4, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest, that is, of course, Jesus. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may find mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. So let us approach the throne of grace in prayer. Would you bow your heads? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this invitation that we may approach your eternal throne of grace and there with confidence receive grace to help us in this time of need. Father, we praise you for every good and perfect gift, and especially today, Lord, for the life of our beloved Jean Densford. For your gracious gift of salvation through Jesus, your son, which transformed her life and now has resulted in experience of eternal life for Jean. We acknowledge the privilege of prayer and many family and friends here right now whose lives have been impacted by the faithful prayers of Jean and of Bill. Father, we praise your name that heaven is sweeter now because of their lives. And we praise you for their influences that have flowed over to us. Now we ask, Lord, that you would comfort in this hour that you would give guidance and anointing on the remainder of this time in your presence, that it may be all you would have this service to be. In the name of your Son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Back in the book of Isaiah, chapter 43, we find some powerful and encouraging words. But now, this is what the Lord says, He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. 
That's the Lord speaking. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. And listen to this. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. You are precious and honored in my sight. And I love you. Now I'm going to read that last part again. And I would like every time I say you or your, you think you personally. Put your name in there. For I am the Lord, your God. The Holy One of Israel, your Savior. If you repented of your sins and you're living for Him in obedience, in accordance with His word, He is your Savior. And He says, you are precious and honored in my sight and I love you. Some awesome words there. I'd like for you to uh, get your hand out with the uh, words to because he lives on it. And folks, when you sing that third verse, when you sing that third verse, realize, see it, picture it. Gene has crossed that river. Jean has fought her final war with pain. Death has given way to victory for Jean. Jean is walking now in the lights of glory, and she knows that Jesus lives. <laughs>
So I'm going to tell you guys something about my grandma that you would never have guessed, and you probably don't know. She loved football. I, I know. You never would have known. Grandpa never let her watch it, but she and I, you know, we're the only two in the family that liked football. So we bonded over that. We were both Indianapolis Colts fans, so that was a lot of fun. Um, also, big peanut m and fan. So we're going to do something with the kids. I'm going to let you guys partake in some of that after. Um, funny story, when she was, um, it was a few months ago um, at Liberty Ridge, and I would bring her little treats of peanut M&Ms, and um, of course her memory was starting to go, so I'd give her a couple, and she'd get excited. Ooh, M&M, ooh, M&M. And then it'd wait maybe 30 seconds to a minute, and after she finished that one, I'd give her another one, and she'd totally forgotten. She just got m and So ooh, M&M, ooh, M&M. And so she had this exciting experience probably 10 or 20 times while we were together. And it was just great to make her happy that many times. Um, but it was lots of fun. My grandma, um, she lived up to the idealized grandma that you want. I didn't realize there was other grandmas out there. I thought this is the way all grandmas are supposed to be. And to me, she was perfect. And she lived up out when I, as I became older. She fun, kind, and gentle. And she had to put up with my grandpa, which all of you guys know. <laughs> that, and I, I kid you not, when I was thinking about what to say, is, is, is that is the biggest thing, is she has taught me gentleness. She has taught me when people bug you and annoy you, and are wrong, um, that you still just treat them with kindness and respect and gentleness. And that's what she taught me from him. And, that was just um, quite fulfilling. Um, as a matter of fact, there was one time I was staying over the night at her house, and uh, I slept on a couch, and uh, Grandpa decided it was time for me to wake up, and uh, I wasn't ready. And so he came in and dumped cold water on my face in the living room, and I had never seen Grandma yell at him so bad. <laughs> she reprimanded him up and down, and even Grandpa looked a little sheepish. So <laughs> that was quite fun. She knew when she needed to break out the big guns with him. So. Um, I am, um, was very excited. I have an eight-year-old, and I was very excited um, for him to get to see my grandma and experience who she was and how wonderful she was. And I know my mom's a great grandma, and I also wanted him to experience how great my grandma was. So um, when thinking about what to say, I just wanted to tell her thank you. Thank you for being everything that I needed her to be when I needed it. So my prayer going forward is that I will emulate her love and generosity and her gentleness. And um, so that as Gabriel grows up, he has the chance to know her as I did. Thank you, Grandma. Alberta Jean Densford. I wasn't going to tell this, but here it goes. We went to visit her over in Lynchburg General, one of the two broken hips, I can't remember which one. And there was a young lady at the desk who should work for the CIA. We said, we're here to visit Jean Densford. 15 minutes later, we still couldn't go see Jean Densford. I said, we're her pastor. We've gone to church over 10 years. Her husband's Bill. He's kind of goofy and tells jokes all the time. We did everything we could, and we could. it was like trying to break into some bank or something. It was unbelievable. She says, you have to give me her first name. We said, Jean. Jean, her husband's Bill, William Densford. She goes to the man's church. They live on, and we told her everything for 15 minutes, and she wouldn't let us in. We never knew her name was Alberta, okay? And I still can't remember how we got in. Um, Laura says we didn't call her, so the only thing I can think is that that young lady finally probably did one of those numbers here like, <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, Alberta Jean Densford was born February the 8th, 1936, in Norwood, Ohio. And she grew up on her grandparents' farm down in Kentucky. She was a godly lady, a godly example, and a gracious lady, which you've already heard that testimony. She gave her life to the Lord at an early age uh, in Kentucky, where her uncle was a Nazarene pastor. After high school graduation, she took flight to the big city of Cincinnati and lodged in the YMCA for a while. There in the Norwood Church of the Nazarene, she met her future husband, William Densford. Now, I'm going to tell him something I sure didn't know right here. <laughs> Thus began quite an adventure as Jean's grandfather chased Bill off his property with a shotgun. 
I sure didn't know that one. Neither one of them ever told me that. Without further details, we most likely would conclude that Grandpa did not approve of this suitor for Jean. But with just the tiniest bit of imagination, maybe after a few days, Grandpa couldn't take any more of Bill's jokes. <laughs> any rate, the next event was in 1955, they eloped, <laughs> and then spent 63 years together until Bill preceded, preceded Jean to their heavenly home in 2018. In those first years, Jean attended Trevecca Nazarene College down at Nashville and was employed as a telephone operator. Now, the next statement I relayed to you just as I received it from a certain family member, and I quote, had Laura in 1960 tried to achieve perfection again in 1963 with Daryl, but failed. <laughs> Anybody want to guess who gave me that quote? <laughs> Gene was a longtime member of the Church of the Nazarene. And for many years, she taught Sunday school. She coached children's Bible quizzing, which is very dear to my heart. Played the piano sang in the choir, and was a caravan ministry leader. Most recently, she was a member of the Madison Heights Church of the Nazarene, which was our privilege to know her then. Jean also had several behind-the-scenes ministries, including one I'll mention, sending multitudes of cards on every occasion to close and distant relatives and to those in the body of Christ as well. Just probably about a month ago, we were going through some of those boxes. I know y'all are perfectly organized. It never happens to you, but we have some boxes that go way back. And I pulled out several cards in there that came from Emmanuel Church of the Nazarene that were signed by Jean Densford. What a ministry she had to so many. An interesting employment that I also did not know that Jean once had was distributing newspapers to the paper carriers, the boys that carried the papers. Now, you know, like the mail, come sleet or hail, the newspapers got to go through. So even if your automatic transmission car that you depend on is not available, leaving only this straight shift vehicle that Gene had never driven, it did not know how to drive, well, the papers have to go through. Well, Marines, sorry, <laughs> Daryl, and piano players are known for improvising. So 12-year-old Daryl got up early those mornings sat in the passenger seat, told Mama when to push in the clutch, and Daryl shifted the gears. <laughs> Seems at the end of each mission, there was a stop at the bakery, so the semi-automatic shifter got his rewards. <laughs> Numerous individuals have enthusiastically testified to me that Gene had a gift of stocking Christmas stockings with exactly what each person wanted. She knew because she cared, because she loved. And I think that's an awesome gift. If you don't think so, ask Joyce when we were early married about the tent that I gave her, or the binoculars that I gave her, or a few years ago, the 20-gauge shotgun that I gave her. <laughs> now, honestly, she said she wanted self-defense. I thought I'd really done it right that time. <laughs> then, <clears throat> there's the sign that Jean clearly lived up to. I don't know whether you all are used to saying amens, but I really expect an amen here, okay? She had a sign that said, Grandma's my name and spoiling's my game. Amen. Well, at least some of you still got that. Amen. Bill and Jean moved to Lynchburg in 1997 to help care for Elizabeth when Laura returned to teaching. Rather than babysitting at a distance, Jean played with the grandkids, read to them, and played board games with them. Now, if a situation managed to register significant disapproval or reach the level of irritation, I'm not talking about Bill now, reach the level of irritation, she had a talent. She had a talent for arching her eyebrow almost all the way up to her hairline. That kind of gave you a big hint. And then in a high-pitched voice say, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, and there were phrases probably frequently reserved just for Bill. 
Just you hush, Bill. Just you hush. Oh, Bill, stop that. Stop that. Boy, did we hear that many a time. And even if the sound were muted, you could look at her facial expression and you know what she was communicating. <laughs> when it came to food, I'm pretty sure Jean learned uh, how to do country cooking uh, there in, on the farm in Kentucky. But I understand she also loved fast food like Burger King and so forth. And witnesses state she was a pushover when the kids suggested Panda House. She would give in rapidly. On my Thursday visits with, visits with them over on Oak, Oakmont Street, I always tried to take some of those Hardy's hot apple pies. Looking into the bag, Jean always showed delight and surely helped them disappear. <laughs> and apparently, and this goes on with Emily, apparently if you put cheese in a mousetrap, you put peanut M&Ms in a Jean trap, and it'll work. Jean was, a quote given to me, incredibly proud of her son becoming a military chaplain, chaplain and of his career in the U.S. Army, being there for his graduations and his promotions. And Mama was proud of Lars being a teacher like her dad had been. And when she finally played the piano at church, Mama thought she finally got some return on all those piano lessons. <laughs> One of Jean's favorite immigrants in entertainers was Perry Como, same with my mother. When Laura found that he was coming to Cincinnati one time, she bought the tickets and took her mom to the concert. It was just one hitch for that good Nazarene Jean. The concert was on prayer meeting night, and Jean had to deal with the guilt of that one night when she had chosen Perry over prayer. <laughs> Speaking of prayer, think of a mama, a grandma, and a great grandma's concerns, and her prayers, and her prayers, and her prayers, and her prayers for you all, for her children. You know, Jean may not be with us like we're used to now, but I want to tell you, I believe her prayers are still valid and still in effect. And you know, let me add, if you're not where the Lord wants you to be, think about it. You are resisting her prayers and her love for you. Thinking about the entertainment Perry Como, Jean also loved TV game shows, and I wonder if that's what contributed to her becoming the queen of trivia. I have it from solid sources that you did not challenge Jean at Trivia Pursuit if you liked to be the winner. Alberta Jean also loved the eternal word of God. She and Bill would read their Bibles together. Their Bibles were always readily accessible. Once while visiting her after one of her two broken hips within that same year, she was overwhelmed by pain. Tears filled her eyes, and Jean began quoting verses from the Bible. Now, folks, if you don't know it, that's not a normal response to a lot of pain. That's only possible because early in life and across the years, Jean had hidden the living, God-breathed word in her heart. Then when the hard times and the suffering came, it was natural to draw strength from that deep well that transcends anything in this temporary world. Jean also loved the wonderful hymns of the church and hid them as well in her heart. She had peace and joy as she sat at the piano and played those hymns. Once while living in an apartment, she hesitated playing them because she was afraid it would disturb a neighbor. When the neighbor found it, he said, oh, no, he said, I love to hear her play the piano, another one of her gifts. When it got down to where very little memory remained, from there to the end, she had the companionship of those beautiful living hymns to be the anchor for her mind and her spirit. My grandma was a really awesome lady. Um, she was always nice. She never yelled that I've seen. She was just really caring. Um, I used to go to her house when I was little, and she let me watch cartoons all day. And she always had the best cereal. 
Um, and when I went to massage school, I didn't have a car at the time, and her and Grandpa picked me up and dropped me off every day till I got a car. And Grandpa's saying, Happy Hannah time, every morning at 7 o'clock. <laughs> but she was always ready to drop anything and help her grandchild in need. And this is something my mother wrote. My mother-in-law was the sweetest, gentlest lady I ever knew. She was the best mother-in-law a girl could have. She never criticized and never judged, but rather gave kind words with wisdom and love. She would always send thoughtful cards for every holiday, and her gifts were things she knew we would love. We lived far away from home most of our adult lives, and in the early years, when money was tight, she and Bill sent money so we could be home for Christmas. She taught me to cook and how to be a good hostess, which is what which in my years of being a pastor's wife were invaluable. She didn't preach, but led by example. Jean possessed all the fruits of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and self-control. She was both a Proverbs 31 woman and a woman of love. Proverbs 31 says she opens her mouth of wisdom and her tongue is the law of kindness. Then 1 Corinthians 13 through four through five describes Jean, love suffers long and is kind. Love envieth not itself is not puffed up, does not behave unseemly, seeks not her own, is not easily provoked, thinks no evil. The way she lived her life every day with humility and love helps us all to be better people. So thank you, sweet Jean, for a life spent loving your Savior and us. Thank y'all. That was one of uh, Gene's favorite hymns, too, and I'm sure many of us as well did as well with my soul. Now I'd like to share some thoughts from God's eternal word, which Gene loves so much. And these truths, of course, are for us, the living, but I see them as coming as well from her heart and the beliefs that she had committed her life to. And, and I would like to just, uh, if you'll allow me, to add a personal endorsement to this truth here. Stonewall Paintball is located on our mountain. So whenever I do the safety briefing, um, I get an extra chance to give a testimony. And number four says, in the process, we are a Christian facility. And I kind of interrupt there. And I say, but to me, it's a Christian ministry. And I say, I bet I have something none of you have. Now, this is when I'm talking to those paintball players, not necessarily y'all. <laughs> but I say, I bet I have something none of y'all have. I have 50 years of evidence that God and his word are real and true. Matter of fact, that 50-year birthday was Sunday before last with the Lord. And then I go on to explain, 50 years ago, my wife, Joyce, and I were on a road to ruin. How do I know that? Well, I've seen somewhere some of my friends have wound up, and in the years of the ministry, I've seen it proven. If it had not been for Jesus' mercy and grace changing our lives, I have no doubt we'd be in some institution, in some prison, in the ground, or our lives just totally ruined. 
But rather than that, not only are we blessed, but our daughters and our grandchildren are blessed. Plus, we have seen his word proven true over and over in our family, in our church, in our nation, and in the world that we live in. With that in mind, I encourage you to give your attention to his living and eternal word, and not just now, but every day of the remainder of your life, just like Jean did. 2 Corinthians 4 and 5, I believe, includes some of the best most well-communicated verses on the differences between our temporary body and our eternal spirits. <clears throat> In chapter 4, verse 16, we read, Therefore we do not lose heart. Don't give up. Spiritually, don't give up. Now listen. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. Outwardly wasting away just jumps out at me. Now, if you're on a diet, you may be spelling out W-A-I-S-T-I-N-G away, but that's not the way the scripture says it. If you're more like me, I will complete 74 years and 12 days. So do you think I look just like I did in my high school and apprentice school graduation pictures? I am so thankful for name tags at school reunions. You know, we're all, the first group says, who's that one? He said, I don't know. Who is, I don't know. I mean, you, who's that coming? Who is that? <laughs> Process of elimination. Well, let's talk, see if we can figure who it is. You know, we don't look like we did <clears throat> when we graduated from high school or whatever. Uh, you see, we are different now than we were then. Because outwardly and physically, we're wasting away. This old body is not meant to live forever here. Just a fact. And by the way, Billy Graham says, you ought to embrace old age because so many people never get the opportunity. But don't give up. You see, inwardly, spiritually, we're being renewed day by day. That's what Alberta Jean was doing every day in the Word and in prayer with her Lord Jesus. That's what she was doing. And we ought to get that down pat, y'all. The real you and me is the eternal spirit made in the likeness and image of God that is going to live forever no matter what happens here on this earth. The real you and me is not what you see in the mirror. But it's a spiritual being made in the likeness of the image of God that's going to live forever. And there's more good news. The next verse says, For our light and momentary troubles. Talking about here in this world as we live for the Lord. Sometimes that brings us into conflict with this fallen world. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. All the problems and hassles we have living for the Lord. Oh, it's, it's working an eternal way to glory that really tips the scales big time. Matter of fact, you know, even mathematically, think about it. If you live to be 159 years old, it cannot mathematically compare with infinity or eternity. You can't even compare them. So whatever we may go through in this little, short, tiny, temporary life in order to stay faithful to Jesus, as the hymn writer said, it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One glimpse of his dear face, all sorrow will erase. So bravely run the race. Till we see Christ. And for Gene, folks, it's not till we see Christ. Gene has already seen Christ. Praise the Lord. Verse 18. So we fix our eyes. It's a choice. It's an act of the will. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen. The things that we're surrounded by and distracted by and tempted by 24-7. No, but we, we fix our eyes not on what is seen but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary. If you can see it, 
If you can touch it, folks, it will not last. It's not worth the investment, including this old wasting away <laughs> body. It doesn't matter how strong you are, how smart you are, how healthy you are, how wealthy you are, how much you accumulate, it won't last. We brought nothing in, and we will take nothing out. <clears throat> and yet, what about 98% of church folks spending their lives and their livelihood for Temporary things that won't last. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. If it is of God, it will last. Therefore, Jesus told us to lay up treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and thieves do not steal. He also declared heaven and earth will pass away. The, the atmosphere, that heaven. Heaven and earth will pass away. But he said, my words will never pass away. And folks, this whole world has never looked so temporary in my lifetime as it does right now. And I believe it's shifting over into passing away mode really fast. Chapter 5, verse 1. Now we know, we can be sure of this. Now we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, this old wearing out body, and that means we die, and we will. We have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven. Tent. Mm -hmm. Question, would you rather live in an old tent that's 85 to 100 years old, or in a nice brick rancher, or a really spacious log home up in the mountains? I think you call that a no brainer. Yeah, I got a good group up here. They're there with it. Praise the Lord. Just be honest here. Think tent. Think hurricanes, torrential rains, leaks, holes, collapses, freezing rain, and ice, 100 degree heat, <clears throat> or a building, not just any, but one whose architect is God and builder is God. Verse 2. Meanwhile, now we're still in his body, we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling. Anybody here identify with that meanwhile we groan? <laughs> yeah, I see a couple smiles. <clears throat> Let me illustrate. For 17 years, I worked at a heavy steel fab shop or plant. And at 4.20 every morning, my alarm went off. After about five hours of sleep, because I was always trying to get one more thing done. What do you think I did at 4.20 every morning when that alarm went off? You got it. <laughs> oh, oh, cut the alarm off. First two days in the spring, when I went to work in the garden after hibernating all winter, what do you think after that second day and we finished supper and I got up out of the chair? Oh, oh, man. Or I haven't played ball in a year, and I get with the kids and I play ball all day long. And the next evening, I go, oh, <laughs> wow. You see, I told you the Bible is true. I tell you, it's born out in our life experience. I think it was the aging president, Samuel, Ant Samuel Adams, in answer to a polite question. Uh, How are you today, Mr. Adams? A uh, Adams said, uh, Mr. Adams is fine, sir. But the house he lives in is becoming quite dilapidated. <laughs> Mr. Adams, the spiritual being inside, was being renewed day by day, and he was doing just fine. But the house he was living in was wasting away, as Samuel Adams said. Do you think Jean may have been longing to be clothed with her eternal dwelling? I do. Verse 4, while we're in this tent, in this body, here it is again, we groan and are burdened because we wish to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling so that what is mortal may be swallowed up with life. Friends, 
Sunday, February the 20th, that which remained that was mortal of Alberta, Gene Densford, was swallowed up by life, eternal life, the gift of a loving God and his gracious son, Jesus Christ. Verse 5. Now it is God who made us for this very purpose. Folks, that's good news. This is God's idea. It's God's plan. It's what God wants for us. Now, it is God who made us for this very purpose. It is Satan who has brought death and destruction and suffering ever since the Garden of Eden. But God, through the atoning sacrifice of his one and only Son, restored his loving, redemptive purpose that our mortality might be changed back into eternal blessedness with our Creator. His purpose wins out. Verse 6. Therefore we are always confident and know as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. We live by faith, not by sight. Jean, young, eternal lady, we cannot see you with these eyes, but with the eyes of the heart, in the eyes of faith, we are confident that you are at home with the Lord. Matter of fact, verse 8 says, we are confident, I say, and would prefer. It's better. It's better to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. This old world's not my final home. What's been the theme of these verses? Get away from this old body, this old tent that we have come to so closely associate with the presence of our loved ones. You see, it can become more like a prison. Think about it. Trapping the spirit that's being renewed day by day inside. All this is saying in different ways, I'd rather be living in my new perfect eternal home built by God just for me. Remember how Jean could get the perfect gift for every one of you? Well, think what her heavenly father can do in building the perfect home for her. In Acts chapter 12, Peter is in prison by Herod. He's awaiting trial the next day, which will lead to his execution. That night, an angel invaded the prison. Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound by chains with sentries at the gate. I'd say he's pretty tightly locked up. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared and light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Not with a uh, thing of hot water, uh, cold water. Quick, get up, he said, and the chains fell off Peter's wrist. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision or having a dream. They passed through the first and second guards and they came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened by itself and they went through it. When they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. Wow. Peter woke up. Now why do I share that story? For some time now, our precious Jean has been increasingly limited by her aging old tent sort of like being in prison in a cell that itself is wasting away while inside her spirit was being renewed an eternal spirit that longed to be set free this past Sunday evening can't you see an angel coming in and poking Jean and tapping her and saying come on highly favored sister it's time for you to be free from this old tent. Well, that angel walked her down earth's last corridor and flung open the gates of that old temporary tent and motioned her out into heaven's streets. And Jean is running and leaping and having a ball. And that's why I believe Jean chose for us to have a celebration today because of her freedom and because of her joy that she finally has. Alberta Jean Densford has fought the good fight. She has finished the race. She has kept the faith. 
She has endured to the end and is now saved. She sees Jesus no longer by faith, but face to face. She has beheld him and heard him say, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Would you want to be called Jean or Elvin? No, that's not in there. <clears throat> Enter into the joys of your Lord. Praise his holy and glorious name. He has her by the hand now and is leading her all over the promised land. She's getting the wonderful tour. <clears throat> and I would like for you now to turn in your hand out to what a day that will be. Let's stand as we sing this. And as you sing, I want you to realize and accept the truth that this is what the redeemed of the Lord do when they leave this temporary old earth and have given up that old temporary tent. Let's sing together what a day that will be. prepared for those who love you and Lord for the joys that Gene and Bill have now I pray you will strengthen Lord and, and somehow sharpen the focus of our faith that we may just capture a glimpse of what Gene and Bill are celebrating now in the promised land in your presence in paradise we pray that your Holy Spirit will minister hope, minister comfort, grace, conviction, endurance, and faith to us according to our needs at this crucial opportunity when we're, when we're slowed down a little bit, when we're saying, be still, my soul, and know God. 
Lord, fix within us a hunger for your living and eternal word like Gene had. So that the hard times come, we will be enabled to stand firm to the end and so be saved. That by your enabling grace, we will so love and serve you on this earth that we will inherit eternal life with you and be reunited with our loved ones who have gone before us. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. The family appreciates your presence and your encouragement and your prayers today. And uh, you're invited now to join them for fellowship and some refreshments over here and you can mingle with them. Thank you. From 1 Corinthians, Paul wrote, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Then shall be wrought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth, giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren and sister, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. I heard a voice from heaven, this from Revelation. I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right. Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. For as much as the spirit of our departed loved one, mother, grandmother, great-grandmother, sister, friend, mother-in-law, all of these, has returned unto God who gave it, we therefore tenderly commit her body to the ground in sure trust and certain hope of the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come through our Lord Jesus Christ who shall give to us new bodies like unto his glorious body blessed are the dead which die in the Lord let's pray our Heavenly Father God of all mercy we look to you in this moment of sorrow and bereavement comfort these and us these dear loved ones whose hearts are heavy and sad. Won't you be with them and us, sustain and guide them and us in the days to come. Grant, O Lord, that they may love and serve thee and obtain the fullness of your promises in the world to come. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.